What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Tuesday, June 4th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, U.S. House passes bill banning Federal Reserve from issuing a CBDC unsung article. Love this one. Dive into everything crazy that the Federal Reserve is doing. Next up, Saudi Aramco's IPO $12 billion share sale sells out in a mere hours. Hungry, hungry for some Aramco. Next up, Russia has a new hotspot for ship-to-ship oil transfers in the Mediterranean. Aha, good old Club Med. Next up, the renewable green energy disaster um, off in the northeast is in the United States northeast is getting much worse. And then finally, U.S. shale mergers could bring steadier oil prices. I'm going to probably push back a little bit on this one. Um, Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets today, mainly talking about the nosedive that crude oil prices took after OPEC decided to extend production cuts. We'll cover all of that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start out with our buddies over there. U.S. House passes bill banning Federal Reserve from issuing a CB, uh, uh, DC. I'll tell you what, I am not speaking clearly today for our podcast listeners, which is normal, but I'll tell you the, the, the bill is the anti-surveillance state act, uh, introduced by uh, majority whip Tom Emmer, uh, go Tom. I am all in, nothing's going to happen out of this because it's going to get dead. Probably won't even be brought to the floor of the Senate. But the it's important to understand, Thursday's vote count was far cry from the vote the day before when 71 Democrats joined 208 uh, Republicans in voting for the Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act, a crypto market structure bill that would give the U.S. Commodities Futures Trading Commission's greater spot market authority over digital assets and spells out how other key market regulator in the Security and Exchange uh, Commission on that sector. I am not for a digital U.S. dollar period. And I think that this was a great, at least, step in trying to make sure that we didn't do it. If you are a U.S. citizen right now, move to a state that will support their own state yep. currency. Just personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, th- we could go down a lot of different rabbit holes with this one because, I mean, America originally tried to have their own state currencies, and it makes right. hard for interstate commerce to take place when Minnesota's got their own currency and exactly. Texas has their own currency. So there's a need for a federal currency that allows you to do business and commerce across state lines the issue is the digital dollar comes into effect with some of the stuff that we've been worried about government control we see how this stuff is playing out in china so i'm on board with this i find it interesting that this was just really cut across uh political lines you talked about 300 213 republicans along with three democrats voted for the bill and 192 democrats voted against it that's a a, a little Well, I don't know why this falls along political lines. I I can tell you, you can go look at those three uh, 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 Democrats that voted with it. I guarantee you they're in a battleground. uh, They're about to be in a very tough election. Oh, I see. Well, interesting. All right, let's move to Saudi. What's up? Okay, let's go to our buddies over there, Saudi Aramco. I, I really like the way they manage things over there. Uh, 12 billion shares sold out shortly after the deal opened. Isn't that kind of cool? I I mean, what's a few billion between friends? Uh, the books were covered within the range of 26, uh, uh, 26 royals to 29 royals. What, uh, how much the, the, how much they're, they're not telling us where the demand came from, uh, but, uh, you can't go wrong with it. Aramco shares fell 1.9% on Sunday, uh, valuating the company about $1.8 trillion. The stock dropped about 14% since the start of the year, since Bloomberg uh, first put out the report. 
Uh, Saudi government, Michael, owns 82% of Aramco, while the kingdom's uh, wealth fund holds a further 16%. Wow. Yeah, you have to realize, though, one of the reasons why this could be an attractive offer, you know, for foreign investors is the fact that, um, you know, you're talking about the the dividend over the course of a year is like a hundred and twenty four billion dollar dividend payout, which means their right. dividend yields about six point six percent, which is pretty good. Now, foreign investment attraction hasn't been much. We've a lot of it is local purchasers, and how much of this is leaving Saudi relative to how much is staying between you know the, the Saudi government and their wealth fund, which you can kind of consider the same thing. So I think this is obviously a quick play to raise some money. They're going to use this money to kind of diversify, again, away from oil and gas fund, some of their other economic right. progress um, and projects specifically. Um, but it, there's a bunch of different um, uh, banks working on them. Um you know, it's it's super interesting. You know, it's, it's my opinion. I would do this in a heartbeat in order to get out of other uh, financial markets with the U.S. oil dollar. I would get out of the U.S. oil dollar, and this is one. Way went from advising Putin to now he's advising MBS. So it's a miracle the world traveler you are. I am, and you know, I was, you know, just kidding. But no, I. Love it. What's next? Okay. Oh, speaking of your buddy Putin. Yeah, speaking of Putin, hey, uh, Russia has a new hotspot for ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers in the Mediterranean. Michael, there's another story that came out today on a side note, and that's uh, sanctions on LNG now are going to come rolling around. And you heard me talk about the dark fleet on LNG tankers. It is real. Uh, so the dark fleet on LNG. So yeah, this is in the uh, Club Med. Club Med is alive and well. You know, I've been talking about this for years. Greece, ship to ship transfer of Russian oil have moved further west in the uh, Mediterranean, just off the edge of Morocco's coast. Uh, via, uh, according to vessel tracking in Bloomberg, the Greek Navy held exercises in the Laetian Gulf of Southern Greece and effectively banned all ship traffic. It's been ship-to-ship uh, -ship transfers in Russian crude and products since the EU slapped the embargoes on it. Uh, hey, this, Club Med, keeping its, keeping its name. I, I'll tell you what, you got to love them for it. You know, yep. if you're going to... Uh, I, I also saw a great, uh, a heartfelt story of diesel barrels that they were trading uh, used diesel uh, oil barrels for uh, fresh fruit. So, you know, just because you're doing uh, trading in gray or, you know, gray market uh, oil doesn't mean that you can't feed the natives, you know, and work out some decent money there for the natives. Yeah, good point. Good point. All right, let's move on to the next one here. <laughs> Uh, let's go to the the renewable green energy disaster off the northeastern U.S. is getting worse. This is out of the Telegraph by David Blackman. This is a quote. Uh, wind turbine maker Siemens Gamza announced even bigger layoffs, saying it would cut 15% of its global staff to adjust for the slowing market. Quote, our current situation demands adjustments that go beyond organizational changes. We will have to adopt to lower business volumes, reduced activity in non-core markets, and streamline portfolios, said outgoing um, CEO uh, Jockian uh, Ektor in a letter to his staff. In other words, oops. <laughs> yeah, yikes, oops. Um, you know, talk about a big oops. I mean, again, it's the problem with, um, again, the, the renewables market has been hit by the fact that they are highly, highly subsidized. And when you start layering off those subsidies, you then all of a sudden have to deal with the underlying economics of the business, which as we're seeing is not great. No. And uh, as we talked about on the energy realities with Doomberg, uh, with David Blackman and Tammy Nemeth this morning, 
uh, the wind farms uh, have really pulled a fast one on the public by using the Inflation Reduction Act in uh, double and triple billing folks by pulling in their turbines even before they were end of life. So the, the public ought to be glad that they're laying people off and it's not doing well. Yeah. Your electricity bills are going to go higher. Let's go to Thanks. the other one. U.S. shale mergers could bring steadier oil prices. Three bullet points here. The key driver for the industry is now returning to more shareholders and preparing for inventory stacked up for years of production ahead. Last week, bullet point number two, is last week the U.S. oil industry saw its latest announcement of a big merger after ConocoPhillips said it had agreed to buy Marathon Oil. Number four. Three, deal value this year has already surpassed the total deal value of $69 billion recorded for the entire first half of 2023. The bigger... Well, I was it's... just going to say, Stu, I think the overall premise that these mergers, which are happening, I think is going to is not necessarily bringing steady oil prices. I think it's setting up these shale companies to be able to endure lower oil prices because as you economies of scale, increase dude. economic, you know, economies of scale, it allows you to produce at a lower and lower margin. And the inventory that you have is easier to evaluate under the given oil price. So I, you know, I love our, our, our friend over at oilprice.com, Irina Slav. I'll, I'll, I'll fickle a little bit with the underlying thesis here. I think it's going to allow them to produce at lower oil prices, assuming things like today, what we saw happen, which is an absolute bottom fallout on oil. We're down four percentage points overall. Right. Um, I still think it's a good thing in some mergers, but I think that this would uh, open a credence to having Congress start accusing big oil of working with uh, OPEC again and trying to do... Uh, price uh, fixing in a global market. <laughs> uh, yeah, in a global market that they have no control over. I, yeah, exactly. I'm sure Scott Sheffield was behind today's drop. So well, I'm I'm still worked up about that one. Don't I'm get done. me started. Talk to you. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, and dive into what happened um, with oil prices today. But before we do that, as always, check us out on the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Hit the description below for all the links to the timestamps, links to the articles, um, and all that such. You can also hit us up, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. Overall markets today, a little crazy, Stu. We saw a Roaring Kitty come out last night and reveal about a two $200 million net long position in GameStop. A lot of that is through wow. options, but we saw meme stocks kind of go crazy today. Overall, though, markets only up about a tenth of a percentage point. NASDAQ only up about three tenths of a percentage point. Two and 10 year yields dropped tremendously, about 1.3 percentage points for the two year yield. 10 year yield down 2.5 percentage points. Uh, Bitcoin up 2.2 percentage points. Crude oil, folks, down 3.8 percentage points on a WTI basis, um, down to 74.06 currently trading as we record this about. 345 here on Monday. That's down $2.93. Brent oil only down about a quarter of a percentage point. Uh 78.48. Natural gas spiked six percentage points um all the way up to $2.75, mainly off the back of some revised forecast, um, which increase our ability for natural demand, uh, natural gas demand. But really, guys, OPEC, what, what drove markets today was was pretty complex. So, you know, then, you know, the next story we have, the OPEC plus extends deep oil production cuts into 2025 was something that the market expected. We talked about on yesterday's show. We expected this to happen. Um, the two point uh, six six million uh, barrel per day cut. Um, that was already in place was extended well into 2025. Um, and then the 2.2 million barrel topper. Um, so it's three points, excuse me, the numbers were 3.66 million barrels per day if, uh, of cuts were extended until the end of 2025. And the topper, the Saudi topper of 2.2 million barrels per day was extended just by three months to the end of September 2024. OPEC Plus did announce that they're going to 
gradually phase out those 2.2 million barrels per day uh, over the course of a year from October 2024 all the way through September of 2025. Some interesting, interesting quotes here. Saudi Energy Minister uh, Prince Abiz Sabam. We are waiting for interest rates to come down in a better trajectory when it comes to economic growth, not pockets of growth here and there. Interesting. couple quotes from Armida Sen, co-founder of Energy Aspects, a think tank out of uh, the Middle East. The deal should be the deal should align market fears of OPEC plus adding back barrels at a time when demand concerns are still rife. Um, another uh, quote over here, and this is mainly about the overall markets. This is from uh, John Cudcliffe, partner over at Again Capital. These are hard numbers. Um, that the, uh, the the hard numbers are that the market is well supplied. If we do not get a spectacular number on Memorial Day in the U.S., that's going to be game over. Mainly talking about how okay, OPEC was going to do this already. Now the fact that we have weak demand forecasts. You know, OPEC can only do so much because we're we're still if, if with these cuts we're already oversupplied. Well, these cuts aren't going to help unless you increase the amount of cuts. Nothing's going to change from a demand forecast side. It's pretty simple. It's that balance of supply and demand. Right. So, I think the market is looking at this from a standpoint of okay, we know the cuts are going to stay. They're actually now going to unwind this 2.2 million barrels. Sounds like because the UAE is pushing them to be able to put some of those barrels back on the market. Because remember that Saudi topper that I call it that 2.2 million barrels. It's a little bit more than just Saudi. You had Saudi and UAE are really the two big players in that. So UAE wants to start pumping a little bit more oil because. Again, they're going to make more that way. So this oversupplied market that we have right now, you know, layering on top the fact that it looks like the, you know, there there is some toning down in the Gaza war. You know, on Sunday, the Israeli prime minister confirmed on Sunday that Israel has, had accepted a framework of a deal being advanced by the U.S. for winding down the war in Gaza, even though they did end up coming out today, or as you listen to this on Tuesday, on Monday, all uh uh, Israeli did call it a little bit of a flawed deal, so kind of some conflicting signs there geopolitically. But yeah, going to be super interesting uh, one way or the other. What do you think about what OPEC did, Stu? Uh, I don't think they really know, to be honest with you. I, I think it's just because Russia is pump, pumping out everything that they can. They went over their production last time, uh, and they said, oh, we're bad, we're sorry. Uh, I don't know that they have control over their members anymore. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, uh, I don't know how you even price it anymore. No, I don't know. Uh, I I don't know um, exactly how you do it all, but absolutely unbelievable. Um, so uh, what else, Stu? What should people be worried about coming up? Oh, just buckle up for some serious entertainment. Uh, the one story that kind of hit the desk just a minute ago is our chemical facilities are uh, vulnerable to attack. Um, that would be the downstream market is now under uh, really some serious uh, concern, not only the grid, but our refineries. Yeah, absolutely. No, we need to make sure that we uh, we stay up to speed with that. We appreciate you keeping it up. But with that, guys, we're going to let you get out of here, get back to work, start your day. We appreciate everybody checking us out here on the World's Greatest Podcast. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.